Hello there, all you cool cats and kittens. I hope you're doing wonderful. Yeah, anybody that can do high pressure sales, they're gonna have the capacity to sell staging, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We created our brand, which means we created our logo, we created our website, we created that vision. Before we launched our business, we didn't have a clue what our brand was before we launched our business. Hey everybody, Shell Brudnex here with another episode of Stage Your Talk. And let me tell you, I, I, I'm not impressed by a whole lot of people in this world. I'm just not. But I stumbled across this lovely lady three years ago. It's taken me three attempts to get her here so all of you can enjoy her brain and her story and her and let her inspire you to be able to grow your business as female entrepreneurs. So please welcome to the show, Cheryl Eisen. Hi, thanks, Shell. Yes, thank you for joining me. Um, like I said, I've, I've researched you, I've stalked you appropriately online and all that great stuff. So for those of you who don't know, Cheryl actually uh, started out you a real estate agent at one point, and then you started to stage your own listings. And now you have two locations in Southern, one in Southern Florida, one in New York, you have 80 plus employees, predominantly all female staff, um, which I'm sure a few sprinkling of some fantastic men in there as well. And I am just so excited for you because I know you're building something right now down in South Florida and launching all of that with new warehouse, office space, building on all of it. So congratulations. Thank you. We're excited about this uh, expansion too. Absolutely. So let's, let's go back in some time for when you first started staging. So tell a little bit about your story about, you know, I know you started out as an agent and then you started to stage your own listings. And from that point, what, what was the tipping point that said, you know what, I want to do this part of the business? Um, I was an entrepreneur before I started selling real estate uh, in the dot-com era. So I had tons of experience in various different areas. I was an art director, I was a graphic designer, I was a headhunter, I was a, a technical, a software trainer. So I knew a whole bunch of different skills. And then when the bubble burst, I, I didn't have a job and I found something in real estate. Luck I was just lucky. I had no experience in that or in interior design. But I was watching, while I was on unemployment, I was watching a show on HGTV called The Stagers. And I thought this was mind blowing. I thought this was amazing. So the first, uh, when I first got into real estate, it was a friend's listing. I came in with a listing, which is really great. And his apartment was like a dorm room. And I was like, I saw this show. Let me try to stage this thing. It's called staging, you know, let's do this. And, um, and I went into real estate with this one listing that I staged and nobody in New York was really staging. Like it wasn't in a thing in New York. I know in California it was for a while and in uh, Canada. So I tried the staging thing and the listing sold um, on the first open house for uh, all cash asking price uh, sold with every piece of furniture, everything in it. And it didn't like no one knew what this was. So everyone in the building who came to the open house, all the brokers that came were like, what is this? What is the staging thing? And can you stage my listings? And so I started not only being the, the staging broker, the staging agent, um, which got me listings because otherwise it's very competitive to get listings, mm -hmm. but also brokers and agents started to hire me to stage their listings. And I kept selling real estate, stage my own listings staging, staging, staging. And a couple of years into it, I was doing more staging for other people than I was selling real estate. And it was more fun. Yeah, a natural progression. This is such a small world. I have to tell you that one of our other keynote speakers is Matthew Finlinson, and he was on the stagers. Oh, I love that was the show that like inspired me to do it. And I this is it. a small, small world. Let me tell you. So Maddie, if you're listening, look what's happened because of that show. I mean, <laughs> it's just totally full circle. We're going to have to do like uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. We'll start doing six degrees of Matthew Finlinson to see all the different connections that he's made over the years. Um, so I, I love the story. I, I absolutely love it. And I know at Risacon, you're going to be talking about scaling the business because what you've done, it's that's not an easy feat. I mean, I know a lot of things come naturally. You like naturally progress through things. Let me ask you this. How do you personally deal with when you're making a decision and you know you're getting ready, you're starting to think, you know what, we, we need to go a little bit bigger. We need to expand. We need to do this. 
What are some of the steps that go through your mind when you decide how, when you finally pull the trigger and getting over some of that self-doubt, maybe if you've ever had a little bit of imposter syndrome kind of creeps in your head. And then what gets you over that point to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to bite the bullet and let's make it happen. Um, I'm pretty risk averse to an extent. I don't like to, uh, I don't like to do anything until like, I know I've tried everything else and it's the next, uh, it's the next logical step. So I did this business myself while I was earning money, selling real estate, um, for years and years and years. And it was just me. And then it was me and just a handyman. And this is for years. It was like staying up till five in the morning, almost every night on site, you know, really sweating it out and doing everything myself, hanging shelves. I'm sure everyone can relate to this. And finally, when I just could not physically do that anymore, I hired one person to then take over the other projects while I did the other projects. And very, very slowly, I scaled like that. Um, You know, most people would possibly consider an investor and then scaling quickly to take on more business very in a very fast way. I was incredibly slow and, um, you know, and, and, and methodical on how I self-funded the business, didn't grow until I absolutely needed to, um, and uh, a la Warren Buffett. And I just grew the thing very slowly from there. And by the time I was at five people, every year after that, we started doubling in size. So it went from five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and very quickly, you know, after that, at that point of growth. And that's how, you know, I knew I was in the right path. So when you started to double your staff size, did you do that as part of a strategy or did that just happen to work out to the way it worked out? It was part of a strategy. You have to do, uh, you know, a spreadsheet and understand your numbers. You have to understand what you can afford and, and what the ROI is of expansion. You have to be willing to make little to no money for several years and just really reinvest in the business. And uh, I, you know, I was used to that because I had other businesses in the past. So I understood what the process would be, how difficult it was, how there's no social life, no life, and just a business for a while. But it really, you know, it just really pays off. But yes, you have to understand your numbers. You have to replicate what it costs for one pod of people to be functioning as a staging group and you as your staging group. And then this person is a state, you know, this group is a staging group and you create these little pods and send them out and to, you know, execute your business. And that's how it, that's how it works. I love it. I, I absolutely love that. So with um, the expansion now into another location are, and especially a, a destination type location, are you doing anything in the short-term rental markets? Oh, absolutely. So not an Airbnb type of thing, but uh, it, we, we, sp- we focus on the luxury space. So when there's a need for um, a billionaire who needs to rent a space because their place burned down or they're you know waiting for their interior design stuff to show up, there's the luxury rental um, furniture thing. So it's Airbnb on that scale. Basically, we do like a full what we would do in staging, but it's for people to live on. So uh, there's some level of FF and E, and it has to be a certain level of furniture versus what you can get away with as stagers because people will be living on it. Uh, and so you do an interior design rental for a year or two years with people living on the furniture. It's very similar. Yeah, I love that. So I think another part of your business, if my stocking memory comes back to me, is that you have also um, have uh, departments within your own company, your warehousing, where you'll make repairs to your own furniture. And do you also build your own furniture? Do you have your own furniture line now? We do. So we... Um, We have exclusive lines that we've um, partnered with overseas, and that's exclusively IMG pieces. And we have an in-house fabrication department who experiments and creates our own unique pieces of furniture. The goal down there, we created our own bedding line um, because I couldn't find bedding that I absolutely loved that would sort of be broad appeal and match everything. And we're growing that from there. I just feel like we have to make our own furniture on the fly when I can't find a coffee table that's, you know, 30 feet by whatever. It, these things don't exist out in the world and we need them for these huge apartments and these huge houses. So we make them very quickly. And that's how that part of the business grew. I love that. It's just, what I like about your story is that um, so many people, 
I do a lot of business coaching. So, so many people that I talk to, they say, okay, I want to accomplish X, but if I want to do that, this, this is, this is too much. This is going to happen. This is an obstacle. This is a barrier. They, and they focus on all the obstacles, why they can't do something instead of switching their mindset around saying, no, no, this is the goal. I'm going to blow up those obstacles. As we get closer to the goal, another one goes away. And I, I see that with what you've done, you've done, you do a lot of problem solving. So it's like, I'm not going to, I've got a problem. I've got an obstacle. I can't get inventory in as quickly as I need it. What am I going to do? You know, we're going to build it. Of course we are. So a problem solver is super important as a, as an entrepreneur. And I think once you're scaling your business, it's really about how quickly and how well can you solve all of these obstacles, all these problems? Because I always say to people that you know, obstacles aren't there to keep you out. They're there to keep people out that don't want it badly enough because so many people just give up. And it's like, if you can figure out ways to accomplish your goals and, and blow up those obstacles, it just makes such a world of deep, it's just genius. And then it grows into something else as well. It does. It's like a natural evolution. It, you, you start to like flow into a direction that just is naturally where you're, you know, where you're headed based on the decisions you make and the risks you take. And I think obviously everyone in the beginning of their business should do like a business plan and a SWOT analysis to understand what the obstacles and the opportunities are. Right. And, um, but obstacles and challenges to me are, it's the puzzle of business that you have to solve. So if there's this huge obstacle, how could, you know, we can't do this. I'm all about, yes, we can. How can we not, you know, why can't we, it's how can we, and we figure that out and some things work, some things do not, but you learn it very quickly and you have to know when to give up on the things that don't work uh, and, and really focus on and, yep. you know, and accelerate the things that do. Yep. And the other thing too, is that when people, you know, you give up on what doesn't work, it's just to, be able to recognize that's not failure. It's just the results of what you just tried. It's not a big deal. It didn't work. Massage it, tweak it. And ultimately it's going to work better than the thing that you tried that didn't work. So it's not a bad thing when it doesn't work. It's a good thing because now you got something better out of it. Right. And there's always a lesson about that mindset. Always a lesson learned. Yeah. Exactly. Always got to learn a lesson. All right. So we are just about out of time, Cheryl. I thank you so much for joining us today. Any final closing words? Uh, people are going to see you at RisaCon. Uh, what is one or two things that they can expect to learn from you at your presentation at RisaCon? Uh, well, I started uh, my business in a very scrappy way, a la Ikea and a, and a you know, glue gun uh, and making my own art. And I grew the business to a, like a large, you know, 80 person company with several different departments and, and a really like a world class logistics operation. And I'm going to explain how to get from, you know, A to R. <laughs> if you will, and everything in between and how people can understand how to scale a design business and a staging business, which is not an easy thing. Yeah, it is not. Well, I'm impressed with your business and I know everybody else will be, but you can't learn all about that unless you get your ticket to RisaCon. So go ahead and go to risaconvention.com, get your ticket today. The live sessions are going to be uh, September 30th and October 1st. And then you also have access to 20 to 30 on-demand sessions that you'll receive that week. You can watch them at your leisure, in bed on your iPad, a week later, a month later, whenever you want to. Until next time, everybody, happy staging. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks, Cheryl. Bye-bye.